That's okay. All right, so I just wanted to start this morning with the land acknowledgement. So the Olympic Natural Resources Center, or ONRC, acknowledges the indigenous peoples on whose homeland this research is being conducted, including the Macaw tribe, the Quileute tribe, the Ho tribe, and the Quinault Indian Nation. We have a responsibility to improve relationships between nations and to improve our understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. And we work a lot with the four coastal tribes and um, of course, work on their seated and UNA lands. Hold on one second. Oh, yeah. Aha. Okay. All right. We're working it out. All right, so just a quick roadmap of where we're going this morning. I will first kind of take a step back from the science piece of it and tell you a little bit more about an ecosystem well-being framework that we use at ONRC and how this feeds into a process called learning-based collaboration that we use to engage local stakeholders and communities. I will tell you a little bit about an overview of the type three watershed experiment, knowing that it's a large study and I'll just focus on a couple of the different operational scale treatments. I will tell you just a little bit about um, learning groups that we've been forming and how that feeds into our collaborative process. And just a little bit about how this might apply beyond the Olympic Peninsula, because although this is site specific, I think that the theories and philosophies behind this work have implications for um, beyond just the region. Okay, so I wanted to start with this ecosystem well being framework. We use this at ONRC um, through this type three watershed experiment, but also in every of the projects, all of the projects that we work on within the center, both upland, riparian, and aquatic. This ecosystem well-being framework has two key components, a community well-being and an environmental well-being. Um, these two components are inherently interconnected and have interactions um, between these two facets where learning occurs. And for us, we emphasize that people are part of our ecosystem. So to think about the way we manage and work in an ecosystem includes the people that use those spaces and rely on those spaces for their personal or economic well-being. Um, this contrasts some other frameworks and models that are out there that oftentimes prioritize the environmental side first and perhaps work with the communities after the fact. And through, especially through this type three watershed experiment, which I will get to in a minute, um, we have been really prioritizing working with communities from the ground up. So we're co-producing and co-designing research with people who are inherently affected by it. But Creating a space where ecosystem well-being can thrive and um, can work starts with a process for engaging people. So this feeds into our process of learning-based collaboration. For us, we define this as um, a space where managers, researchers, tribes, stakeholders, and community members can engage with one another to address management questions and options together in the same spaces um, with, a, prior, with a, a prioritizing structured learning through this process, not only about the outcome of the work, but also about the process itself. Um, this learning-based collaboration is situated within a greater body of literature published on collaboration. Um, anywhere from uh, folks working on um, state and federal levels of collaboration with um, different stakeholders, environmental groups, and even tribes. Um, people have published a huge amount of work on different scales of collaboration from uh, both temporal and spatial, like in this um, landscape scale paper, and um, a more methodological um, body of knowledge considering um, constraints and, and opportunities in the collaborative framework. So this is to say that our learning-based collaboration process fits in with this um, existing body of knowledge um, on the topic of collaboration. So in our work, we use this learning-based collaboration where we're actively um, engaging and meeting with stakeholders, tribes, um, uh, managers, community members, and all of their knowledge and insight um, and critiques are all fed into our type three watershed experiment, where our novel approaches and novel prescriptions are incorporating their ideas and their needs, knowing that they're often affected by decision making processes, but they don't always get a say in how those lands are managed, with a key goal of this feeding back into this ecosystem well being framework. So with that little bit of information as a background to the way that we approach our, our work at ONRC, I wanted to tell you a bit about this type three watershed experiment. 
This is a collaborative study between Washington DNR and the University of Washington through the Olympic Natural Resources Center. It is a 20,000 acre watershed study on the west side of the Olympic Peninsula within um, uh, DNR's Olympic Experimental State Forest or OESF. The OESF is a 270,000 acre large area on the west side of the peninsula. And this is one of the largest study that, studies that's going in in the coming years in that space. I think it's a good time to acknowledge that it's really challenging um, and a little bit unprecedented to have a study where managers and researchers are going and working hand in hand to create these experiments. Um, for, of course, good reason, a lot of research doesn't um, occur at a scale that uh, managers can often use um, for, of course, many constraints like there's um, uh, only so much people power and money and grant writing that we can possibly do and finding a land base to put in an operational scale experiment can be really challenging. So this has been many years in the works of uh, working with DNR, both their researchers and their managers to try to work through all of the nuances that go into putting together um, treatments and new experiments that will push the needle forward and it still be operational. <clears throat> um, a, a big part of this experiment is trying to trying to expand the management toolbox, knowing that DNR has a lot of really good resources and tools in their tool belt uh, or toolbox rather to um, implement uh, uh, different management prescriptions. And we see this as an extension of that. So trying new approaches to management through this adaptive management cycle. We have been working on the study for five or six years now, and the both the riparian and the upland plan are finished. Riparian plan has been through peer review, and the upland plan should be received back to us outside, out of peer review in the next couple of weeks. So the first round of timber sales went out last month, and they'll continue for the next 12 months. Um, the operators and loggers will have two years to implement, to, to do any logging on the sites. So we're expecting the treatments to go in in the next two to three years. And I'll tell you in a minute, there's um, a lot of different treatments and a lot, um, a lot going on. So it will be a huge effort to put all this in in the next three years. <clears throat> so this type three watershed experiment, or I, we usually call it the T3 study. So I'll probably call it that from now on is on this west side of the peninsula. It's been designated into four distinct watersheds, so we can have four replicates through the study. And there are four, ooh, yeah, pointer, four overarching strategies that you see here that I'll get to in just a minute. And as you see, these are dispersed across the four watersheds in this region. So we can have um, four different regions where these treatments are being implemented and study the effects of, um, of these different replicates. So the four strategies that I mentioned can be seen in these four brown boxes on top here. We have on the left hand side, we have a control, which is a no entry. Um, we're for now going to put it in for the first 10 years, so a no action for the first 10 years. We have a standard management, which include uh, both riparian and upland. Um, and this is a standard practice that DNR is already implementing on the peninsula and beyond. I'm going to skip alternative two for a minute and jump to alternative one. Alternative one is creating experiments that are based on researcher experiences or um, gaps or um, key uncertainties that have been identified by researchers in the field. And I will be the first to admit that I'm an upland person and a forest forestry person. So I probably cannot answer as many riparian questions as you might have, but on the upland side of it, we have two novel prescriptions going in on this alternative one, a complex early seral where um, the stands will have um, a, a harvest where we'll, where we'll have eight trees per acre remaining. And then um, we're trying to encourage this complex or messy early seral conditions, including downed woods, snags, natural biodiversity in the understory, and hopefully a good recruitment of natural seedlings being regenerated with supplemental planting as needed to get the stocking up to, up to par. In addition, there's an accelerated variable density thinning which will bring the total trees per acre down to 66. So 66 trees per acre in these stands with the intention that we can create additional gaps and have um, a better understory and habitat for uh, wildlife and ecosystem processes. But really what I wanna tell you more about today is this alternative two approach. This alternative two um, strategies 
are based on stakeholder feedback. So it's based on working with local community members, stakeholders, and tribes to understand uh, what do they want to see out of this research and how can we implement their ideas and strategies into our work. So I will tell you about um, two uh, strategies that are both considered forms of ethnoforestry. So a cedar alder polyculture and a variable density planting. And we'll go into more detail about those two in a minute. But first, um, through my work at ONRC and throughout my PhD work, I've been working under this umbrella of what we've been calling ethnoforestry or a people-focused forest management that requires the study of all constituencies, managers, tribal people and nations and stakeholders who shape, are affected by and inform forest policy. And this includes studying their affect, their behavior, knowledge, their feelings and preferences and values insofar as it's associated with a forested ecosystem. So if you think of this learning-based collaboration framework where we're trying to engage people through this process, this feeds into ethnoforestry prescriptions that are based on the feedback of local people and studying their interests and their values and what they want to see out of their ecosystems. On the uh, west side of the Olympic Peninsula, um, the land ownership is, is parcel, like it is on most areas of the state. We have um, state and federal lands, tribal, um, timber, uh, timber companies owning parcels of land, and private landowners. And in these same spaces, we have a number of different rural communities that rely on those spaces, those public lands in particular, for their livelihood. Historically, they've used um, They've, there's been a, a, you know, a large forestry industry that has changed dramatically in the last uh, two or three decades, um, but people in these communities rely still on these spaces for their economic and personal and cultural livelihoods. <clears throat> um, a lot of people still are involved in the non-timber forest products industry or in some form of agroforestry, um, and it makes up a, a fair amount of the um, of the economy in this region, and certainly puts money in people's pockets. People um, in this region are harvesting salal and beargrass for the floral industry, um, cedar boughs at Christmas time, um, chanterelle mushrooms, and, and other mushrooms certainly. Um, so people are really affected by actions and management decision making processes. And so it's important for us to consider all of these factors when creating our prescriptions. So the, the two prescriptions I'll tell you about in more detail in a minute um, include these three factors. And if you'll remember, or there are two of the components of this ecosystem well-being framework, um, both this community piece and environment piece. And it's worth saying that this is all being done while still producing a consistent uh, rotation of timber, that we're not just prioritizing, say, non-timber forest products and not prioritizing timber, but this is all being done on lands that are managed for timber and on, on state trust lands where there's a fiduciary mandate to manage for timber. So just for a little bit more detail about these three components, on the community side, we're trying to consider people's cultural or personal use of plants, their access to land, and any hunting and fishing activities. On the environment side, considering understory biodiversity, especially promoting early seral species and their habitat, and the food chain for wildlife, and especially for ungulates, but also for anything from pollinators to big game. Um, and then this is all being done while still producing a consistent rotation of timber. So I just want to go into a little bit more detail on this community piece, because I think that um, I find it really fascinating and I think it has good implications for this group. So we've been doing quite a bit of community and stakeholder engagement work over the last five years or so, and certainly other programs within ONRC have been doing it for longer. My colleagues and I have been doing semi-structured interviewing with both tribal and non-tribal people on the coast and sitting down with them um, to talk about how they use public lands, how it's changed over their lifetime, and how management decisions or really research could test other alternatives and other pathways. I've been working with non-timber forest product pickers, weavers, hunters, and fishermen through this process. Um, in last April of 2021, uh, DNR held a conference on the peninsula, well, really uh, remotely, as many are these days, and we introduced a lot of these different treatments, and it was a good opportunity to have sessions where we just received feedback and tried to incorporate it into the study plan. 
In spring of 2021, we held individual sessions for each prescription where community members could sit down with us um, and give us feedback on each prescription one by one. Last October, we held a field tour where about 40 people came out representing um, managers, uh, environmental community, the timber community, tribes, and more, um, to go into these stands to think about how these prescriptions are going to be implemented on the ground. And then a, a few months ago, we released our Upland study plan for any involved stakeholder to review in its entirety. And to their credit, a lot of them worked through a 100-page document and gave us feedback about a, a lot of different pieces of this and both the research questions, but lo the logistics of putting in a large-scale study like this. And then just month, we held another conference that was focused on collaboration and how we engage people through this process. So I wanted to just uh, touch on briefly some key themes that are emerging through this process. The first is that I've heard, certainly through my interviews, so many community members talk about issues of access, um, that locked gates have become um, increasingly more prevalent, which I'm sure is due to the parceling of land and changing of land ownership. Um, and the, a lack of available plant material when they get there. So both a physical lack of access for some community members, like a, a locked gate in their way, but once they get there, stands are sometimes being managed in a way that's not promoting plant materials that they want to see there anyway. Um, I think a, a really big uh, revelation I've had through this process is that over and over, we've seen community members and stakeholders uh, interested in innovation, like really wanting to see us push the needle and try something new. Like um, in, in certainly all these communities, they're well aware of the threat that climate change has to their forests and into their own personal uh, livelihoods. And they want to see research happening that is trying something new, um, knowing that ecological processes happen on a long time scale, and we're not gonna find the answers to anything in the first several years. It's gonna take decades for these um, results to, to really emerge in a meaningful way. And maybe the most exciting part of this that I've seen is that there's a lot of common ground between, between groups that are on very opposing sides, and um, especially groups that you might put together in a room and wonder what the outcome of this meeting might be. Um, there's been really cool meetings where we've had people from the timber industry and people from environmental groups come together and really enjoy the same prescription, which I felt like was a wild thing and, and really great to see um, this, this happening. So, okay, let's go get into the two prescriptions I'll tell you about. The first is this ethnoforestry with a cedar alder polyculture. So as I'm sure many of you or all of you know, um, Western red cedar is a slow growing, shade dependent uh, species. On the Olympic Peninsula, it's not planted very often um, for a number of reasons. The first being that it's a much slower grower than most of our timber species. Douglas fir can be harvested at 45 or 50 years and Western red cedar is pushing 70 years. <clears throat> Um, it also is subject to browse, as I'm sure we've all seen in the woods, that ungulates are naturally munching on the cedar and it threatens the stand if we're just going to put all of our eggs in the cedar basket. Um, but it has a lot of value. Its wood is prized for a number of different things from like building bridges and um, shingles on houses and, you know, so much in between. And it also has a big cultural value. Tribes, you know, across the state and beyond, but especially on the west side of the peninsula, um, rely on having an available source of cedar for bark stripping in the fall. Um, not to say that there's no cedar across the landscape, but if we're thinking about places where cedar or other species are accessible to, to people to actually go harvest, um, there's not a lot of spaces left where community members feel like they can go to harvest cedar bark. Um, so that's the first part of this. The second is to introduce alder into the mix. Um, I know that a lot of foresters and other people consider alder to be a weedy species that they'd really like to pull out of early cereal environments, um, but we would like to introduce it into the space and actively manage for it. As like a really fast growing light dependent species, we think it pairs well with cedar. Um, it is, of course, a deciduous plant, so its leaves are dropping in the fall and providing nutrients for the soil. And it's one of our only nitrogen fixing species out here in terms of trees. Um, I'll get into more of that in a minute, and 
Um, I am really hopping on the Alder train and inherited it from my supervisor who is so gung-ho Alder. Um, but we think that this combination between the two of them could be really great. On the west side of the peninsula, and it's not certainly not limited to that area, we've seen the emergence of Swiss needle cast be a really big threat to home to, to landowners. Um, Swiss needle cast is a, a fungal pathogen that impacts Douglas fir trees. And as it's moved up through the coast range from Oregon into Western Washington, um, it's uh, really threatened Douglas firs, especially close to the coast. So thinking about ways in which we might diversify the species um, that we're managing on the west side of the peninsula, especially within 10 miles of the coast, we think that a cedar alder mixture might be um, an interesting thing to try. Okay, so I thought I would just give you a little bit more information about both cedar and alder. So on the alder side, there's been a huge amount of research that's been published thinking about the ways in which alder shapes other ecosystem processes. Tom, uh, Thomas Hanley from the PNW Research Station up in Southeast Alaska has published a handful of papers on both upland and riparian red alder and its connection to understory. It can positively impact understory biomass um, and can certainly um, add biodiversity and has positive links to species, species richness and diversity. Um, and we also see red alder being beneficial to our soils of course, because it's a nitrogen fixing species. Um, but in a paper that my colleagues and I recently submitted to Forest Science on this right hand side here, um, we were looking at the Wind River Experimental Forest in um, Southwest Washington, where following the Yakult burn in the early 1990s, um, foresters replanted the stand with Douglas fir in the 1930s. And I think as a bet, some folks planted um, intermixed red alder in a strip going through Wind River. And following this, um, a number of different scientists, especially soil scientists, moved through or uh, did research in the site to understand the influence red alder is having in these stands after this burn. The red alder is long gone now. It's a stand of all Douglas fir, both in this historic strip and out of the strip. And if you see here, this blue line are the Douglas fir heights of trees growing in this historic strip versus in the controls. Um, inside of the strip where just Douglas firs are growing, the Douglas firs are growing, um, at, I think the height is at an average of 120 feet, and in the outside areas it's 85 feet, with a much higher site index in, inside the strip. And all of this is to say that there's long-standing legacies of all those benefits to soils, especially in depleted areas, and we think it's um, a reason to consider planting alder to think about the long-term impacts of, of this species. We know, of course, that alder is really fast growing and certainly outcompetes or can outgrow all of the conifers for a certain length of time, but it, of course, will catch up. And that uh, western red cedar is a much slower grower species, but as, some, as a plant that's shade dependent, we think that this combination will, will work in its favor. First, the elephant in the room is always that you're going to lose them all to browse. So we're thinking about um, uh, ways in which we can mitigate for this. So in this study on the right hand side, you have uh, the red cedar density and in stands that have no deer versus deer. And of course the stands with no deer have much higher densities of red alder or um, red cedar rather. So these are things that we're considering through this process of how can we create uh, sub studies within our experiment to understand um, how, um, how to mitigate for this. So we will be implementing um, this treatment on these four different watersheds and each of these uh, units will be subdivided into multiple pieces and we'll have a gradient of different levels of cedar and alder from 100% cedar to 100% alder and a combination in between. That will allow us to look at the different proportions and which may be beneficial um, and how that compares unit to unit and watershed to watershed. As you see here, we have the proportions of cedar to alder from 100 on either side, and then a 75-25, a 50-50, and a 25-75. We have budgeted cedar mortality into this mix to understanding that, of course, some will, be, will, um, will die from one reason or another, and then also have additionally budgeted some alder mortality in there as well to make the total 500 trees per acre in all of the treatments um, across the board. We've even been 
trying to work through how we how we implement something like this. There's both the logistics of how you um, you plant in a way that will achieve the total trees per acre you're getting at, but how do you work with crews that do planting to help help um, create these treatments uh, and and allow them to go in in a way that's that's correct to the study design. So there's like multiple levels of nuance to this. And this is really where the DNR managers have been amazing to help us work through um, what's feasible and what's not. It's also been really fascinating to hear stakeholder comments and where one person might say, you'll never, you'll never get a crew that can do this. And some forester <laughs> would say, you you don't you've never worked with the planting crew before like they, they can do this so it's been cool to, to see the differences in community members who have worked in the forest industry and can um, speak to what planting crews and other operators are able to do out there we're expecting that the cedar and alder will grow together um, at year 35 the alder will be taken out will be logged with the cedar remaining um, we have a, a tentative plan right now to remove the alder and then plant a new crop of alder under the cedar, which is kind of wild, um, <laughs> and let the cedar grow to age 75 or to age 70. At that point, the second crop of alder will also be mature and they'll both be taken out simultaneously. This might work in the treatments that have fewer cedar, and so there's more space when the alder is removed, but we'll, we have 35 years to not that. Um, but this is the initial plan that we might uh, per, we might grow a second cohort of alder in the same space. Of course, there are key uncertainties through this process, or there would be little reason to create this research. Um, of course, cedar browse is something that we're considering and needs to be part of this process. Um, we have a, a, t a working group right now trying to put together a, a sub study plan to think about different ways we might mitigate for this, including planting spruce and cedar in the same hole, piling slash around um, cedar seedlings to try to mitigate for it, overstocking with cedar, a number of different things to, tr to think about how do we actually test this um, in a way that's uh, feasible economically to make happen. The second planting of alder is certainly an uncertainty of if this can actually happen and will the cedar growing shade out the second crop of alder or not. And of course, the future markets for these species. Um, it's unclear um, what the markets will hold in the next 30, 35 to 70 years, really. Um, we've seen a really a huge change in the number of mills in the last 30 years, and we don't know what's going to happen in the next 70. But I, I wanted to highlight something that a stakeholder said that I thought was really hopeful and, and something um, to think about going forward. And he said, we should not plan to meet business as usual in 20 or 30 years, but plan on what you want usual business to be in 20 to 30 years. We can't predict what's going to happen. If we are forecasting 30 years out, I encourage us to build toward what we want that to be, what we want those systems to function as, as opposed to feeling a little bit handcuffed. And I thought this was a really effective, and, and we've heard this from um, folks in the uh, the rural business community that if you're planting, what's the plan in 30 years? And I think that it's really hard to predict what the market's going to be like in 30 years, but that shouldn't stop us from trying to be innovative now. Of course, numerous different research questions we could be asking through this, and I'll just give you a handful. Um, the first being, how will different cedar alder planting ratios affect total cedar and alder growth and yields, including effects of site index and aspects of wood quality? Um, timber and revenue production through the first, at least the first one full cedar rotation, maybe even two alder rotations. And the net revenue and DNR administration costs after these specific investments in site preparation, planting, and tending are accounted for. So we're considering all of these different aspects um, through this research. And now we'll tell you about the second of, um, of these prescriptions, this ethnoforestry with variable density planting. Last experiment, the, the last prescription, this prescription is also focused on um, stakeholder feedback. We've heard from a number of different people on the coast over the last many years that they've watched species that they value decline over their lifetimes. Um, people have commented the, um, the reduction in ungulate habitat and that limiting um, hunting. And of course that is 
combined with parceling of land and access and a number of different things. But we've heard from people over and over that hunting has been much more challenging. And a lot of people in rural communities rely on hunting for their subsistence use. In addition, we have people talking about um, the reduction in things like bear grass for cultural weaving um, and a lot of uh, different species that are associated with this early seral habitat. So this treatment will um, is intended to try to manage the understory in the first um, 15 to 20 years after an initial logging has happened um, to think about ways in which we manage these early seral spaces. A really great paper um, from 2019 from Fallon et al. was published in PNAS. They looked at a number of different things, but one of which was the decline in early seral habitat over the last 30 years. And you can see on this left hand side, um, many of the different regions had not a ton of decline, some had a little bit, and this is the coast range. So we've had a, a, a major decline in early seral habitat in the last 30 years. I think there's often a prioritizing of old growth and late seral habitat, but there are just as many um, species, endangered species associated with early seral habitat. And we feel that it's important to think about the ways in which we encourage early seral habitat in these spaces, both for wildlife and our ecos in our environment, but, but also for people who need those spaces to, to, to gather and to hunt. And if we think of some kind of forest stand that has a disturbance, like in this case, and especially out here, a wildfire, but for us, something like a, uh, something like logging, really the first 10 years or so, you have a pulse of available sunlight and nutrients. But after that, you start to have this competitive exclusion um, where there's limited understory. And maybe that can extend beyond to 15 or 20 years. But on the coast, we see a dense amount of western hemlock ingrowth in these stands where we could have 10,000 seedlings per acre growing in and taking up a lot of space for understory. So through our approach, we're trying to think about alternative ways to planting and managing these initial stands to promote um, other aspects of early seral habitat. Our, you know, our, a typical standard planting practice where you have a grid-like system that um, uh, are planted 11 or so feet apart, depending on what your you know, overall trees per acre are going to be. And this will be incorporated into our, our plants. We have a standard control to work against, but we're also going to be doing a, a clumped planting arrangement where we're planting Douglas fir seedlings in clumps ranging from four to 36 uh, seedlings per clump with the intention that we can manage these gap or interstitial spaces for um, ungulates and, and also cultural and personally relevant plants. With the caveat that the, the western side of the peninsula is rugged and this, the watersheds we're working on in are very steep um, and have tough terrain. And that's probably not feasible for a lot of people to like wander down for a long ways to, to pick huckleberry or other species. So instead, we've heard from a lot of community members that they would like us to prioritize ungulate health and habitat and creating better food sources. So that's what we're gonna do through this experiment. We're going to try to manage these interstitial spaces to consider um, the effects that it has on wildlife in the area. And for us, that means that we will have one or maybe a couple different re-entries into the stand after it's planted to probably go in with um, crews that have a backpack sprayer on and target um, plants that are not beneficial to ungulates. Certainly invasive species, but also some natives that can be recalcitrant and can really dominate. For us on the west side, Salal can totally take over an ecosystem. And it, it of course has a lot of benefits, but um, it can absolutely dominate in, in the first you know, 10 years of the stand. And it's not um, really adequate food sources year round for ungulate health. So this is kind of the, the, break, the breakdown of how these treatments are gonna go. Over here, you see the different clumping arrangements from a zero control, um, four trees per clump, a 16 and a 36. Um, on this side, you'll see the different spacing. So of the 36 tree clumps, we have two different planting strategies, one on eight foot centers and another on 10 foot centers um, to try to see what that variation might do. And this can relate to how much percent of interstitial space is occurring uh, uh, based on the, the size of the clumps and their positioning. 
Um, there are many different questions we can ask about this. Um, how quickly those gaps will close with natural regeneration of other trees, um, how quickly they'll be shaded out, which will of course impact the understory that can grow there, and a number of other ones. We've been working a lot to try to think about ways in which we might implement this um, with some fun and wacky designs. Um, this is showing a four tree clump, a 16 and a 36, and the ideas in which ho how we might actually plant these. But if we plant them a little bit closer together in clumps, it allows for additional space within these areas to manage for these gaps that are created in between. So to go to these key uncertainties, um, we certainly are wondering um, what the tree growth rate in the clumps will be. Actually, let me go back for one second. So um, we can imagine that trees inside these clumps might grow differ differently than trees on the edges. And just the exposure of um, trees on the edges where their canopies receive more sunlight might impact their growth rate. And so we're thinking about how um, asking research questions on how are these differences um, in, in tree growth rate over time. Also, how does tree mortality um, vary within these clump sizes? Um, we know that there's going to be some tree mortality, but we expect that if they're growing um, with enough space between each other, there will be um, like inter and intra tree competition that will force them to grow quickly um, and straighter up knowing that there'll be some mortality there. Um, another uncertainty is how do we manage understory for a particular species? Like that, um, there's, a, there's a number of questions around that of what species should we prioritize? Can we train crews to ID particular species and know that they're just going to kill those species? And what will the long-term effects will be to say the soil in the area? And what are the costs associated with one or maybe two re-entries into the stand? And how does that shake out um, to think about how much understory is being, it is, is still growing in those spaces? And then monitoring is certainly a question, not only in this treatment, but really in all of them. If this is an operational scale study, how do we possibly monitor in a meaningful way that can help us get conclusions? Which I will get to in a minute. And some research questions that we're thinking about, like how will tree spacing influence crown development, growth, or mortality? How will clump or interstitial patterns affect the total and net revenue of these stands? Um, how will clump or interstitial patterns affect the composition, the growth and yield of understory plants that are providing this early seral habitat? And will selective understory management succeed in favoring ungulate and culturally preferred species? So these are all things that we'll be evaluating through this process. And now I just wanted to talk a little bit about monitoring, both because it's important and because I think it's been really exciting the last several months to, to um, work on this part of the project. So it's not feasible to put in, to, to send crews out and put in ground plots across all of these watersheds. So instead, we've taken a hybrid approach in the uplands. So we will be doing both remote sensing and some ground plots, mostly so we can ground truth um, the remote sensing techniques. We've been working with West Fork Environmental out of Tumwater, who've been flying drone LiDAR flights in these stands. They flew, I think, 23, stand, 23 of our regions last summer, and will fly a bunch more this summer. Um, they just came back from another flight. Um, and it's amazing the level of detail we can see in these drone LiDAR flights. Um, in aerial LiDAR, uh, the, we can hope to average about eight to 10 returns per square meter. And in these drone LiDAR flights at the canopy level, we're averaging about 1,200 returns per square meter. So a huge amount of density um, that can uh, be really wonderful, but takes an amount of time to, to parse throughout this data, um, both people power and computer power but it's shown an amazing level of detail. This is a 10 meter um, uh, area that you're looking at here. And we can like clear as day, see a lot of these stems down to the ground. And even the topography that's occurring down here, some understory where there's gaps even. Um, and just from here, I bet we can identify a lot of these tree species just from looking at their crown development. This is, in large part to Dr. Bob McGoy from the US Forest Service's PNW station. He's based in Seattle and we've been working with him for the last several years. Um, and he's been putting together a lot of these drone LiDAR flights. 
We've also had wonderful capstone students with the University of Washington who have been working with us and Bob, as well as some folks from Microsoft to do machine learning to automate this process. Um, we're using these ground plots to ground truth and match up these areas so we can eventually get wall to wall coverage of these stands. Um, it's been really crazy to see the difference in tree morphology when looking at individual trees. And if we just look, I think you can still, oh, hold on. Uh, you can't quite see this because of Zoom, but in the Western hemlock, there's this like clear droopy leader that happens. Um, and we can see really clear as day the difference between the Douglas fir and the hemlock that are happening. Um, we're taking the top three meters of the crown um, and feeding it into our machine learning, and it's finding and identifying all of these species throughout the stands. This coming summer, we'll prioritize finding additional Sitka spruce, red alder, cedar, uh, silver fir, and other species that we don't have enough um, information on right now so we can improve the model. But it's been a really fascinating part of the process. Cool, thank you. I'm almost done. So that brings us to uh, this idea of learning groups. So uh, I've presented a bit of the study, but there's so much more going on. And while we have dozens of researchers and managers working on this, we can't possibly um, do everything through this work. And stakeholders and community members and tribes want to see um, other components of this work evaluated. So we formed these learning groups. And these are groups that are really led by stakeholders with the involvement of a T3 researcher um, and a, a DNR person to make sure that we're providing that information, but it's really led by them. Um, and they can decide what projects they're working on related to the study um, and how they want to achieve them. So, so far we have developed these groups, a, a carbon sequestration, invasive species, economics and harvest operations, a remote sensing, aquatics, tribal, cedar browse, and history. Um, many of the groups actually had their first kickoff meeting yesterday, and there is so much excitement and enthusiasm and honestly expertise um, that is so valuable to our work. So th these groups might work on anything from trying to develop um, a sub-study and management plans, like say the cedar browse group, to um, being informed on this management process, reviewing monitoring plans and doing some data analysis. So really up to them and what they wanna do. And then just the last piece of this is to think about beyond the Olympic Peninsula. So I know that a lot of this is work that we're doing on the west side of the peninsula, but I think the principles apply beyond this area. This idea of using something like learning-based collaboration or another collaborative process to work with communities and stakeholders to involve them in the work um, and developing novel approaches to land management. We know that the future with climate change needs to, um, needs to result in us having more adaptive capacity. And we think that trying these novel approaches to, to um, this research will be really meaningful going forward, not just on, you know, on the peninsula, but beyond. And so with that, I will take any questions. Feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call if you have any questions or want to be involved at all. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, I, I read a letter piece. Oh, I hope I can answer your question. <laughs> no, I, I, so. I'm a I'm a lighter enthusiast, but not this. <laughs> uh, are you using more than one or are you just looking at one or? or um, they're using near infrared. What was it? Oh, thank you. Um, the question was about the remote sensing lidar work, um, and uh, what is is it the light spectrum that you're asking? Okay, yeah, they're, I believe they're using near infrared um, and red, but I I don't know all of the details on that. Um, I will say that West Fork Environmental um, is their the drone lidar arm of their work is new, and they flew one round of sensors last summer, and they just improved their sensors to get more. I think to get a greater spectrum. Um, so we should we don't know what those results are going to be yet, but we're hoping yeah maybe even better. Yeah. Next question. Um, 
I guess one common first is that we've been on a site where that uh spruce cedar parent planting actually worked really well. Ah. Uh -huh. The question was, um, in cedar alder polyculture, instead of planting a second round of cedar, a, a second round of alder, would we rather plant maple or some other species? Um, that would be a really fascinating project. I think if there was a, a potential market for this for maple, which there certainly is in some capacities, um, that would be a fascinating one. Um, my advisor and uh, one of the leads on the study is super interested in, in um, expanding the maple in on the peninsula. So I think that's certainly in the realm of possibility. Casey. Follow up question with that. What do you think the density will be with the Western red cedar for that second alder planting? Do you, is there a tree trait for count that you're expecting with mortality? Just think about shade and Mm. Yeah, so the question was, um, with mortality of cedar, how much are we expecting, uh, like, live cedar at, at the end of, say, a couple of years, right? Or at the time of the second uh, round of planting for the altar. Uh, okay, um, if I can just go back really quick. Sorry, shield your eyes. Just because I share your concern regarding sufficient sunlight. Sorry, this is going to be a lot for a second. Okay, <laughs> thanks for bearing with me. So we have estimated what we think mortality will be. So we're projecting um, different levels of mortality based on the amount of planting. So we're hope, I, 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 this is our intended projection that we'll have 500 cedar total when the just cedar and then we'll go from there. That's per hectare? Per acre. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that seems okay. really dense for planting all their with five hundred cedar per acre. But I yeah, I think this is the intended mortality, but we'll see what actually happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you thought about planting on the second um, some of the other native species, just the the cherry and that, rather than just one species throughout? mixing a few of the different species that are, you know, more understory type, but still tall bush or small tree type. Yeah, totally. So the question was, are we considering other species in the cedar alder polyculture after the first round of alder has been taken out um, to include other species like bitter cherry or other shade dependent ones? That's a great idea. Um, so along with maple too, we can consider other shade dependent species underneath, especially ones like, um, I'm gonna, well, yeah, uh, 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 trees that might have some kind of non-timber forest product value too. It would be like a nice combination to get both of those out. Mm -hmm. And rather than having a monoculture setting in, how much more agriculture would look at different ground, but after that, that 75-year harvest Understory ground, mm -hmm. where they are connected, that more nutrients and mix in the soil. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. What was that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, in the areas you're managing for the ungulates in that second mm -hmm. research area, yeah. um, are you considering? Uh, Right now, we think it's going to be 100% natural. Um, I'm working on a pilot study, a, a small scale five acre study nearby where we planted understory species. We planted five species in rows in an agroforestry kind of way where they're dense rows with the intention of picking. Um, and I think we learned through that process that that was incredibly labor intensive and difficult and with not always great returns like the there's a lot of mortality in there so we're certainly not going to plant any uh bare root or any other individual plants um but i i, I think we're, the seeding is kind of a question mark i don't 
I don't know, I personally know enough about the success rates of seeding um, in this area. I know that there's lots of companies like say drone seed that are working on, on ways in which we might like large scale application of seeds in their case, more conifers or, or more trees rather. Um, yeah, but that, that's a good question that we might consider. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank